Hi, Conrad. How are you? Where are you? Good, good. I appreciate you joining us today. Mm -hmm. awesome. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. So um, I'm just going to start off, as I always do, welcoming folks to our bi-monthly featured artist series here through the Berkshire Cultural Resource Center at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. I'm Erica Wall, the director, and we are joined today by Conrad Igier, an amazing artist who we have been really excited to talk with. Um, and I've had the pleasure of knowing him for a couple of years now and seeing his amazing growth. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it feels like it's been a long time coming. I have to admit that we had a nice conversation not too long ago, yeah. but I always have more questions for you. But first and foremost, how how are you doing? I know that you have a virtual exhibition coming up, and um, I'm sure you're busy. How is that going? Uh, it's, it's 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 keeping me busy. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I'm I'm very occupied, and I'm grateful yeah, for it. You know, uh, I'm just like still running my full time student practice, and like I have a lot of things going, and uh, just trying to take things uh, one day at a time. Right, right. And so, you know, we always start these out. I should say, Conrad, that this is our opportunity to share with folks in the community who are both artists and who aren't, who know about art and who don't. And we just take this as a chance to learn more about artists and what they're doing, but to also create some transparency that helps artists who aspire to do what you are doing to navigate. And so that I ask all of our artists, but most importantly, we want to talk about you, your practice and um, things that we could learn from your experiences. But first, tell us where you're located. Where is your studio space? Uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, all right. And, and I got to ask you, do you how, how do you pronounce how do you pronounce Detroit? 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 <laughs> all right. I, I always feel like weirded out about pronouncing it. You know, okay, like, you oh, say oh, it. You, wait, you say it. Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I would say Detroit, and they'll Detroit. be like, "What? Detroit? Yeah. Detroit? Detroit? Yeah." I have a tendency to speak really quickly, so I probably mm -hmm. say it just like you, Detroit. Okay. Detroit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I've been here for two years now. After school, you know, I went to Cranbrook. Cranbrook was like an hour north of the uh, Detroit in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, so all in all, I've been in Michigan for four years now. Okay. And so that was when we um, met, when you were just about to uh, finish your MFA at Cranbrook. Right. And you did your undergrad in Chicago. Is that correct? Or Illinois? Uh, Illinois. It was like a suburb uh, in Chicagoland, uh, Elgin, Illinois, 40 minutes okay. west of Chicago. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about this in one of the one of the um, projects that we're doing this year is a year long project that is looking at the discussion around immigration and specifically we deal with in the arts. And so we have invited artists who have immigrated to the United States to pursue their practice and you would be one of them who was born in Ghana and a lot of your work translates that experience of having been born someone somewhere else and then relocating and continuing your career and so you are from Ghana and I, I believe you shared with me that you hadn't been back for quite some time until last summer that's correct until last December December last and how how was that how was that going back and having been gone for so long and then and then coming back how was that yeah, it was it was a it was a bittersweet experience. Uh, I was I was welcomed home. Uh, a lot of people didn't know I was going to be returning. And I just it was just like a huge surprise for like most of my family and friends. Uh, and there, there there's this there there's this feeling that I had there that I don't necessarily have yet. Sometimes it's just like this longing for a sanctuary where you aren't often distracted with the political, social, or like religious climate here, you know, like I went back home and I didn't even go to the city. I went straight to the village, you know, because okay. I had like some from their friends there. So uh, I, I, had, I had a great time. It was it was very peaceful, uh, inspiring. Uh, I was around like, you know, lots of nature. Uh, I was living up, up on the mountains. Oh, uh, wow. So 
and I'm, I'm planning on going back again this year. And I wanted to be like, you know, a continuous student where I also go find some families, find some friends and like work with them as models and also like, you know, have them be part of my characters and like subjects that I focus on and paint, you know, I suppose right. only focus on people that I know here in the States. Right. And so, um, you know, I think we've been talking a lot about this idea of being somewhere else or having been born somewhere else, had the experiences of that moved here, but then now considering, um, you know, it is, I'm sure that you consider Ghana your home, but now that you've been here so long, I'm sure that this is a second home for you and that it seems within your work, you've definitely reconciled that experience, that synthesis of the two, of the two spaces, the cultures, the people, and you've talked a lot about that within your practice. So that takes me to the second question that I usually ask all of our artists, which is if someone didn't know anything about you and your practice, how would you explain what you do and what you focus on in your work? Mm. Okay, so I would say I am influenced a lot by uh, an Afrocentric style of storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, given that I grew up in Ghana, I was surrounded by uh, certain like li li literature formats and like certain styles where children will sit around like a fire camp, like listen to like, you know, the elders, you know, talk about myths and legends and fables. Uh, so I always grew up around narrative creating and like, you know, the idea of like telling a story through, through like, you know, human interactions. Uh, and that is something that I'm focusing on now in my practice where I use historical and maybe sacred narratives uh, in a more contemporary sense, you know? So like I might revisit the past and like, you know, try and situate it in a more uh, modern setting. Uh, and then with that, I'm also trying to focus on themes of power and empathy. Uh, you know, like going, going back back in the day, it was, it was hard to come, come by cartoons or like, you know, literature that was like centered around black characters. This is, and this is back in Ghana too. And, you know, it was, it was mostly, these are the movies and channels that we were watching where like, you know, all the characters were white. So as, as a little kid, like that sort of down on me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and then again, like Ghana was colonized by the British and we gained our independence in 1957. Uh, so most of like the, the educational structure and programming that we had was just like straight from, you know, uh, the colonial times. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole idea of like, well, how powerful images and representation is mm -hmm. uh, became, became something pressing for me that I wanted to like address in my work. Uh, so, and, and this is where my sense of empathy comes in. So when I came to the States in 2008, I was very antisocial, you know, I, I found it very hard assimilating and, you know, and adjusting. Uh, and I was, I was, that was the first time I was exposed to this whole like identity politics, the whole idea of blackness, the whole idea of, and not even that, but just like colorism within the black community too. Uh, I got, I got, I got ridiculed and like, you know, uh, laughed at for how dark I am among my African, you know, brothers and sisters. Uh, so that was like another interesting take. So normally there's this whole idea about the double consciousness, right? Where someone who's in, who's in my minority group thinks about how they play a role when they are in and out of their setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, with me, it was more so like a, uh, it was more sort of like a triple consciousness, so to speak, right? Because even when I was in, like around my Black American friends, I still felt out of place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it just made me think about empathy in a sense, and that's like one of the driving force, forces in my work right now, where I paint models multiple times in a given composition. And by doing so, I'm trying to talk about the differences and similarities between the image versus the self, right? Some of the perceived notions that we have about, you know, individuals and how I create multiple characters out of one person and, and then pit them against themselves. So like one person might be the father against the son or like a friend in the foe or like, you know, a noble person and a commoner, right? Like, so like there's this, there's this multiple layered interaction between multiple figures who are all one but different, you know, sometimes I might change the skin tone, I, might, I think you can see here a little bit, just like a little tease with like mm -hmm. the scale. And so basically all these characters in here are just like one person. I mean, but we, we can, I can give you a tour like later on during the discussion. Mm -hmm. But so that, that is the gist of, of, of the practice right now. Yeah. There are so many things in there that you said that, 
you know, and we, we talked a little bit about this in our previous conversation, but all of the experiences that you have had here and talking about what goes on within uh, a relocation to a different country and the placement of, of that, that feeling, but also within the Black community. And then we talk within uh, the African community and all these different experiences, they are so similar to what we experience here as African Americans. It is, and, and I think that that is what makes your work uh, resonate with so many people, but also that creates this really amazing sense of, again, this hybrid of seeing all at once. And as you just described in multiple, multiple situations with one character. Um, and then, so when you, when you are talking about this idea of narrative, scale, and all these different tools that you use, do you feel as though there is, it is more of a story that you're trying to tell to illuminate, you know, um, maybe an understanding of experience, or is there something specific that you want the viewer or the audience to leave with? You know, is there a certain intent or is it more of, I'm telling a story, it is your interpretation, these are things that I experience, or is, I, I hope that someone comes away with this. Mm. Yeah, uh, it, th th that's an interesting point, and, and and I think I think it's both. Uh, I do I do try to convey a message in every painting that I do, uh, but at the same time, it, it, it isn't necessarily forceful. And you know, and I'm and I'm open to like how viewers come come to the painting to to the piece with their own interpretation too, because there there are certain fee feedbacks that I get, you know, from from uh, friends and viewers that I I never thought about or never think about, you know, when when they put. Empathy, where you walk up to one of these paintings, you have to force yourself and be in the shoes of like all the characters at once, right? Because like they all look, they all look alike, right? Uh, so it, it 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 begs the question, like you know, what, what, how different would it have been if all these characters were different and you know didn't look alike? Uh, right. So then I also think about what tra transformational art is, so, you know, in a sense that. I'm hoping that this work rises above and beyond identity politics, about blackness, about just like being in a box, about gender, about about race, about colorism. I mean, like obviously, like these are some of the tools that I'm using, right? But then I'm hoping for like something grander, like a grand narrative that 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 is about that, you know, a, a, a theme of of triumph, and empathy, and power, and resilience, and self sufficiency. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So with all of that, um, I've seen the work over the last two years, I guess now we're going on three years and mm -hmm. it evolves and it grows. So let's take a moment to see what you're working on now. Everybody always loves to see the artist space. Would you give us a little tour and talk us through some pieces? Yeah, let me see. This is, uh, let me see if I can flip more. Okay. Camera. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not tech savvy. <laughs> that makes two of us. It's perfectly. <laughs> so I have, we'll, take, we'll take what we can get. All right, I have a, I have a laptop where I can switch. I have like a camera in the back of the laptop. Okay. Is there like a, you know how like the phone separate between the selfie and the, I don't know how to do that in Zoom. Um, there should be a little icon um, that lets you twist, that, that has the arrows. Right, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, come on. Tech support. Okay, I, I don't know. Uh, all right, all right. Well, I might just turn on the camera. Around. Yeah, that's fine. That yes. works perfectly. So, uh, I'm stuck here. Okay. Uh, these are little wood panel routed CNC. Mm -hmm. uh, board that I'm working on, and like these are like laser cut material, so it has like a relief oils and acrylics, and then obviously with the glitter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us 
tell us a little bit about the choice of the the borders of the of the panels and why you do that right so this was a, a motif that i picked up from my time in grad school where i was working as a laser cut technician okay. uh, and I had an opportunity and chance to see most students come into the uh, the fabrication shop and uh, work with you know all sorts of materials. So like it just opened my idea to like fabrication and like going beyond the conventional, traditional sense of a uh, uh, or like the rectilinear shape you know of a canvas. Right. Right. Uh, let's see. I mean, I'm like fast forwarding, but I mean that that that's that's where most of the structure comes from. Where I started playing around and using using these motifs to think about uh, ideas of you know or like the uh, metaphors of migration, you know, uh, and being homesick and wanting to and wanting to like have that connection between like these two hyperspaces, you know. Mm -hmm, uh, I mean, here mm -hmm. hyperspace and like you know my my place back home. Do, so that that's so interesting. So the laser the laser cutting is done by you. That is something that you bring to it. So because that was my next question. So you have someone fabricate that. That is something that you have been doing and incorporated into your work very early on. Yeah, very early on. It's, it's, it's been going on for about two years now. Okay. Okay. And so um, tell me a little bit about how you feel your work has evolved um, since leaving grad school, right? So a lot of, you know, when we first met, we talked a lot about that transition from mm -hmm. finishing your MFA program and what it means to go into the real world and all the expectations, aspirations, mm -hmm. um, surprises that come along with that. But how do you think that that has evolved uh, since you've left your practice, your experience, um, how has that been for you? It's it's been a very sharp and like a a sharp le learning curve. You know, there was so much that I learned in grad school, which is like a, a very shocking phase because I I thought I I mean I knew little to like nothing while I was coming in from undergrad to grad school, mm -hmm. uh, and then that was even like ten times fold coming out of grad school and like you know starting to take on this full time practice. Uh, mm -hmm. And I had to learn a lot, you know, and I had like some good mentors in my, in my corner to help uh, Beverly Fisherman being one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's been, it's been a very humbling and great, grateful phase so far. And it's made the work evolve in, in a professional sense, knowing that it isn't about me anymore. It's more about the work and what the work is trying to say and do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I remember in grad school, grad school was the first time I was exposed to like this whole concept of blackness, uh, but you know, uh, queer theory, black theory, identity politics, it was very jarring, you know, uh, 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 I was like, why do I have to be part of, part of this, this, this academic structure? Like, how does mm -hmm. that influence my work? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, and, and obviously, like, these are themes that are being, like, you know, it's, it's on the rise, uh, you know, given, like, the last three years where mm -hmm. black narratives and black art and, you know, like, artists who are in minority groups, like people of color, uh, are getting like some shine and some some highlight, uh, which is which is due. Uh, but then being an African and coming from Ghana and and being forced to be part of that conversation, especially like in grad school, where I had to all of a sudden deal and talk about blackness, was was a little. I wouldn't say like off putting to me. It was, it, was, it was interesting. Like I feel like I had to, I had to be part of that kind of conversation, but I had to make sure that that wasn't the only thing I was trying to say in my work. Uh, mm -hmm. So at that point, my question was like, right, like, how do I again, like, how do I rise above, and how do I how do I rise above, or make the work rise above, being boxed in into like identity politics, and this is where my my sense of like empathy and theme and triumph came in, where I wanted the work to be a universal language that wasn't only talking about skin color, race, sex, you know, uh, and these like tri tribalistic things that often split and divide us. Uh, so that's that's where the evolution process process is getting so far. Yeah, I think that you know uh, that's a conversation that this to who deals with that in this is it obligatory? Do you feel you know is it is it something that weighs heavy when 
already working through practice and process to find your voice, but then you feel that you have to be representative of other voices or other discussions within this. And I think that that is, um, it is ongoing, but you're right. We definitely have a tendency to focus on the understanding of blackness when we need to understand the context in which that's being questioned. And if you are not um, part of what is most discussed, that it always seems as though we focus on other, right? So um, I think that it is definitely evident in your work that the, the pursuit of something beyond that and not having to respond, but merely to share, definitely comes through in your work. Um, and I, you know, and, and we've gone back and forth with how well it has evolved. And so tell me a little bit about, I'm sure lots of people have wondered, in the midst of this pandemic, how has that impacted your practice? How has that, um, has it been detrimental? Has it been advantageous in some ways? We've heard lots of different artists share that, but how has it been for you? Uh, it's, I would say it's been like an independent experience. Obviously I do, I do uh, sympathize and empathize with like what's going on. I haven't had friends and family members, you know, uh, getting affected by it, but I know of other people's like relatives who've uh, been affected by it. Uh, but in terms of like my student practice, there was like a brief moment where the studio complex and building that I was working in had to get, like get temporarily shut down, I think early February because of the, the paranoia. But then other than that, I mean, things opened back like swiftly afterwards and I've been in here. Uh, and the only little hiccup that I also had was finding models, right? Everyone was trying to play safe. And, uh, you know, I, I had to start thinking about how to, when and how to like, you know, reach out and acquire models for my practice. Because like, that's something that like I, I heavily use all the time, you know. Uh, and, you know, like sometimes I walk in here and I look at all the female, female models that are painting and I, and I realize that most of them are from Bumble. Cause like there was this phase where, <laughs> there was this phase where like many of us were like, you know, on these date, uh, dating apps and just reaching out and, uh, Every, every, every once in a while, like, you know, I'll make a connection. I'll be like, hey, I'm an artist. Like, you want to shoot? And I'm like, yeah, you know, and they'll come through. So I have, like, four people in here who are just <laughs> all from Bumble dates, but here. Right, right. I think, I think that's, a, that's an interesting um, reflection of the time. I think it's completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wonder if, because um, I was going to ask you a little bit about, um, your use of models and the choices and how, how that process works for you. So that seemed to be, it, it obviously was a, a challenge or can be a challenge during COVID, as you said, when people are trying to maintain social distance. Mm -hmm. But tell me about um, your use of models and, and when before pre-COVID, how that worked for you and why versus, because um, I, I know that before you've said that you, you prefer to meet in person and to have sit for you versus using images. So will you tell, tell us a little bit about your use of models and the process? Yeah, so normally I first come up with a, a, an idea, a story, a theme, a narrative for a show. Uh, and then I build out the characters in each painting and I try to figure out uh, who might be like suitable. Uh, I mean, most of the time I just try and get as much random photo shoots. There's like photo sessions that I have for the models. I don't have them sit and paint. But I, there was just like little theoretical direction phase where I have them come in with like a, 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 a collection from their wardrobe, you know, that I could use and like switch out as they play different roles and different characters. Okay. Uh, so they might bring different, you know, clothes to the studio or I go visit them at their residence, you know, and then they have the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity of like using the entirety of their wardrobe. Uh, so I try and find characters that I think sometimes fit the structure of the story boards that I'm working with. Uh, and then all, obviously all of these are also like black characters, right? Mm -hmm. Or African-American characters. Uh, mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember coming out of, of uh, I remember my first year in grad school where we had a, an open studio event where like in, People. I mean, I tried that. I tried that a little bit, right? It, it was just like one of those things that messed, you know, messed with my mind because 
I was in the context of like one of the richest zip codes in the Midwest, you know, uh, which was which is Bloomfield Hills. Mm -hmm. And I had to, I had to think about whether figurative work or painting black people in that context and 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 at that time too was going to be like sustainable, but. For some reason, you know, like I still, I still held onto that. You know, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't my idea of trying to, trying to define success by, you know, how much was sold and, you know, sales. And so, I mean, I stuck to the narrative. You know, I kept on painting black people. I mean, people, not just black people, but people that I was familiar with. You know, and I had a yeah. connection relationship with. Yeah, um, you know, I every every time we talk, there's always a. Um, a notable difference in our conversation and it's really beautiful to see because I remember you sharing that story with me and mm. there is this I don't know is this gonna you know is this gonna work out but it but then it your final year came and that was mm -hmm. a very different experience absolutely, absolutely yeah right into this Erica I have a waiting list I have all these things I need to do this is yeah. And it was like, you know, it's one of those catch 22s, careful what you wish for. Mm. But it is, I think it is a testament to your commitment to what, what your practice is. And it is, it's a, it's a glorious thing to see. You know, um, I told you when I, when I sought you out that we're always looking for exemplars, right? Our, the work that I do is most most committed to the broadest representation of the art world that there is. And that we, we look not for, we look through what we see to find what we don't see. Mm. I think that your work is definitely what we just had to look through to see what we were looking for, what we didn't see. And so it is amazing. And those are the stories that I think that most of us are interested in hearing but what takes many artists to that next step but it is about the commitment it is about mm -hmm. the perseverance mm -hmm. it's not for the faint of heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's something that requires um you know the sort of the sort of dedication and confidence though i think that grows through your practice and mm -hmm. that is what each time we talk there is always this amazing um just sharing that goes on about and transparency in that sharing about it felt like this but now it's this and it's just a beautiful it's a beautiful progression to see so with all of that we've talked about other things that artists face within this pursuit of uh of a career and mm -hmm. we do you know we when we first met i was most concerned with sustaining your practice how does this work what does that look like for you and clearly that is not an issue right now and i'm happy to see that the but for those of the for those of us who want to know how you've done that and what some of the challenges are right because we don't know what we don't know mm -hmm. so what when you look back on these last two years since having mm -hmm. uh, finished your your graduate work um if you were to give others advice in terms of pitfalls to look for, um, how to persevere, how to overcome some of the challenges, because that's what we are most interested in. And what are the ways in which we have to be aware that, and I will say, you know, those within, uh, you know, the, the BIPOC community have to navigate in order to continue and sustain a practice may be different for others. And I wonder in your experience, are there, other, are there any things that stand out for you that you, you would share with, with your yeah. I think I think one of the questions that I, that I had early on that I, I, I'm hoping that other, you know, other people have and also address uh, is, I mean, it's like, it's twofold. Like the first is, what, what are you in for? Right, and then the second is like, what is your end game, right? And the first bit, the first question, which is like, what are you in for? Is it more of like a privilege and a luxury that you're trying to like, you know, tap tap into the art world and just create something on the side as as a hobby or like a something that you, you hope you hopefully, uh, which turns out into like a full time practice or like, are you in it because it's the only thing you know how to do as like a survival mechanism? Like, I mean, coming here is one of the things that I kept on hearing that ours ours is a privilege. 
you know, ours mm -hmm. is a privilege. Uh, you know, it's you, you, it's not easy, easily accessible to like certain classes, certain certain groups of people. And I always found that contradiction and very interesting because like growing up back in Africa, uh, I only knew how to draw, color, and paint. You know, like reading and writing wasn't my strong suit, and uh, it was the only thing I knew how to do, and the only way I knew how to communicate. So that that it, it came from no, you know, it had nothing to do with privilege. It was more about a survival thing. Uh, so I came to the states uh, in two thousand and eight, and I, I I was missing my family back home so much where I just wanted to switch out of my my major, which was in art, and go do air traffic control because I I figured it would give me some quick money and I could take it back home, go help the people back home. Right? Because I was thinking about money, and I realized that I was putting a hold on the only thing that helped me survive, which was art. Uh, and for some reason, like I stacked to it and I was like, all right, at this point, like I'm all in, you know, and uh, uh, my, I remember there were times in undergrad where my mom had to take out a 401k for me to like, you know, keep going to school. I got kicked out twice for tuition. Uh, and then like, you know, I kept hearing this, this riddle or this joke about the difference between an artist and a bench. You know, like it's like these are the things that I was hearing from my, my peers who were in different majors in undergrad, like you know, from the architectural department or like I don't know, the business department, like they'll come in around and ask, Hey, uh, what's the difference between a, an artist and a bench? You know, and then uh, the answer to the riddle was like the bench could support a family, but the artist couldn't support a family, right? So it was like one of those things that was just like cemented into, into my mind. I was, I kept thinking, So is, is there, is there, what, 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 what does sustainability look like? for someone coming out of undergrad, you know, and I was thinking about going back, working on, on the assembly line and coming out of undergrad, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. So I just went online, tapped in the top 10 MFA programs in, in you know, in, uh, in the States. There was Cranbrook. I got out in, see, I got out in the fall. I didn't get out in the spring as like normal people do. I got out in the fall. So most of the application process, processes were, I think were already due, but then Cranbrook was open. So I applied to it. I was put on a waiting list. I eventually got into it later. Okay. And most of my friends was like, yo, you got on a crime book. I'm like, what? I, I, didn't, I didn't even know what crime book was. I knew nothing about a professor. I knew nothing about the culture, nothing about Michigan. I was like, I just want to be in school because like, there's no turning point now. Like, like well, this is the only thing I know how to do, right? right. right. Uh, so I was blessed to be part of a great community at Cranbrook. And even then I had to like work five jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a laser cut technician. I was, I was an art instructor in a public school in Detroit. I was a dorm advisor. I was working on the, the laser cut, uh, the laser cutter. And then I was also working in the museum and I was also in studio council. And I had to do all of these things to like support myself. You know, I, I met like a whole racking up of like a student loans, you know, uh, but will I do it all over again? Absolutely. But probably I, if, if, I, if I were to go back, I'll probably like figure out how to find more grants, you know, sort of alleviate the right. whole cap. But yeah. that's like that, that addresses like in the, one of my first questions, like what, what are you in for? Is it, is it because like you were in for, you know, just out of sheer appreciation because you think it's a privilege or are you in for, you know, survival? Uh, and, right. then, and then the next one was like, well, like what is your end game? Like where, where do you want your art to be, you know, uh, in the next couple of years or like, you know, after you, after you pass or like, do you want your work to be part of a canon? And like, why do you want your work to even be like con considered or like, like looked at? Like, what is the message? Like, what, what, what are you trying to say and, you know, prove? So these are like two questions that I always, you know, keep asking myself. Yeah, I think that those are the questions. They are very important. I've always said the same thing um, with regard to artists that it is, it is something that has to be done. There are no uh, those are the exact questions to be asking yourself when you start to navigate. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the, um, the ideal or the romantic concept of artists being privileged is, it's interesting to mm -hmm. demystify, as you explain that for some people it does require um, the hustle, and we're mm -hmm. all familiar with that. And that at what at what point does that cycle either going to propel you or break you down? 
And, um, and it, it does, as I said, it is not for the faint of heart. Um, when you, when you think about, so when you think about those questions, those two questions right now, what, what are your, what are your answers at this point? So that's what got you here. So right now, Conrad Eager, what are your two answers for that question? What's, what's the end game and, um, you know, what are, what are you in it for? What am I in it for? Uh, for the long run, it, it, it reminds me of uh, the concept of the, the concept around death, uh, and I think this is the first time I heard about it in uh, watching that Disney animation Coco. Uh, so there is this whole idea of the three deaths: uh, the first being when a child grows up and recognizes that we are all here with an expiration date, you know, like the, the first time you realize that there is this concept of death, that's the first death. The second death is when you actually die. And the third death is after death, the last person or the last memory of your name in the world, when it's gone, right? You think about like your, your great grandparents or like versus someone who was like popular and like, ha like, like Michelangelo, right? He still lives among us, you know, even though he's, he's been dead twice. So like if, if Michelangelo in the next, I don't know, like millennium or like 2000 years from now, she just to exist, that would be, that would be like the third death, you know? Uh, but it, it, I, don't, I don't think it's like necessarily some sort of uh, egotistical drive to like have one's name be in a kind of history for that long. It's more like the work is more important than, like, than the name. And then with the quality of work and with the, with the impact of the work, obviously like the name is gonna like follow through, but I'm, I'm only trying to talk about triumph, empathy, power, resilience, sustainability, and how we should rise above, you know. And, and I, gotta, I gotta go back a little bit. Identity politics. <laughs> uh, I, I, know, I know I said I wasn't, I wasn't all for it, you know, and I'm trying to be very careful like in, in how I box myself, you know, in that as many other artists are doing, you know, I mean, right, rightfully so for them. Uh, but one thing I do focus on in terms of identity politics is like character, right? Mm -hmm. uh, looking at one's character and like one's content in, in their character versus like looking at the yeah, outward uh, characteristics, you know, whether it's skin tone, the, the race, the sex, the gender, the height, you know, I'm more focused on. And, and with that, I dwell on names where right? I think about what your name will mean after your passing. Or like you know what your what your name means like you know if we, if we say if I go over to a friend and I say hey uh, I am connected with uh, Erica Wall she's a great personality and like they also know you and like you know we 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 understand that you lived a very great life you you were very relatable you were passionate you were it, it, that that to me is like one of the biggest identity uh, traits and politics that I might want to be you know interested in, in discussing uh, everything else to me is just like tri tribalistic in a mm -hmm. sense. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and I think I think that is very rife in this this climate right now. Uh, so, in that in that sense, that is like part of the end game, you know, trying to drive home this 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 thing, trying to drive home this narrative that we are more, we are that there's more to us than skin tone, than race, than 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 you know, these little things that divide us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as you. As you're talking about the the multiple, the endless, the infinite dimensions to these categories that have been created to try and define blackness or whatever it may be. Um, I wonder when you're when you're in your when you're in your process and you're thinking about which I love this idea of basically what what is what. Your, what is your legacy? But I love that you're thinking about it in the broadest sense, right? We're not just talking, I think we're talking about your significance in the art world, which I have, I have no doubt will be epic. Um, I think about the significance in general. Um, you know, I, I go back to my theme about the myth of absence and that we are here, we've always been here. And as we start to illuminate that, the way in which we inform and educate those that are beginning to expand their understanding and perspective is important. It's yeah. critical and it is to some extent strategic. 
And so, um, you know, I wonder about um, the art world and then the work that you're doing. Um, what are the things that cause you or, or create for you the greatest, um, so say for instance, um, you'd said to me the last time you talked, you know, I, I said, oh my gosh, there's so many things going on for you. And, and you said, you know what, Erica, I'm in my studio. I don't even know that they happen until I read it somewhere or somebody texts me, you know, and I wonder for you in the midst of your practice, is that something that is strategic for you that you put these, you know, you focus, it's about the work, it's about the practice, it's not about what's going on. I mean, it's great that Beyonce put you in Black is King. That is amazing. But the point is, are you able to let go of that moment and think to the next? I mean, enjoy that moment. That's mm -hmm. an you enjoy that moment? Are you enjoying those moments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, go on. Yeah, how is that for you? Uh, it's it's very telling of like how far the practice has come, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and sticking to my guns and being patient. You know, I think that's one of the biggest lessons. Like you know, being patient with all the hiccups and like hurdles that I had to overcome, and seeing how fruitful these two years I've been and like being hopeful of like what, 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 what is to come. Uh, and the same, on the same note, I try to steer away from the noise and the distractions that come with the success, so to speak. Cause like one of the things I really do believe in is that success could be like our greatest enemies. You know, uh, it's like, you get like a little bit of success, a little, a little bit of shine, and then you relax, and then like you know, you 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 lose sight of like what needs to be done. You know, uh, that 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 used to get to me. I think back in the day, you know, because uh, I came from nothing, and then all of a sudden, like I saw how things were turning out, and it was getting to my head a little bit. And I, I, I realized that it was affecting my student practice a little bit. So I've gotten to a point where I try to stay off off the grid as much as I can. You know, there are many emails and text messages where I it might take me days to reply and I feel bad for even doing that. But like it's it's more it's more so to put like preserve my sanity because like whenever I jump on social media, the uh, I mean it's a very inspirational platform to be because you get all these ideas, but then you are also like having to force yourself to, to look at a thousand and billion things other people are doing and try to like, okay, how do I make my work different from that? Like what am I trying there, there's a whole lot going on. Mm -hmm. And this is why I appreciate going back home you know and uh not just going back to another city or so back in ghana but like going to a place where you get to like retrieve and you know recalibrate and create a, a safe space and all like a sanctuary mm -hmm. that will help the student practice more so than probably you know it, it is here i mean i mean that can be done everywhere this is not about, not about me necessarily going back to africa per se but i'm saying it could be a mental thing where sure try to like block all noise as much as possible and just like, you know, put everything into the work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think also too, um, and I, I think in a, in a past conversation, we talked about, you know, in the midst of studio practice, it can be very isolating. That's for all artists. Mm. You know, this idea of still having a support system and a community not for the purpose of advancing your career, but just because that community, which I think is your, as you're describing, for many folks is their family and their home. But mm -hmm. that is an important part of it in any of this because um, it, it, is, it is very fast paced. And you know, I think also when you talk about these ideas of categorizing, um, that can happen within a practice too. And we've had those discussions, you know, the, the idea that you don't want to be pigeonholed into an expectation that this is, this is the work that Conrad does. Should he change what he does? Mm -hmm. not what I want or, you know, or, or how that, you know, and reconciling that for you too, which probably requires a certain amount of solitude to process that, but then that, that community to support that process, which I think also goes back to um, the many layers and how laborious mm. it is. And then the commitment, um, you know, to that, to that labor, which from all indication, you still seem as though you really enjoy your practice. I do. Mm 
I do. I, I, there, was, there, was, there was a lot of sweat and blood that went into it. So at this point, it's like a very huge investment that I can't, I can't let down. Uh, but even on that note, as much as I do enjoy it, the uh, once in a while, the uh, insecurities, the uh, comparisons, the, uh, the all these like moments of doubt that, you know, come from uh, the external life outside of the practice. I'm talking about like family relationships, like, you know, uh, responsibilities, uh, you know, so sometimes it, it takes a toll on the studio practice, but like, it, it's more, it's more like, it, it's just a survival thing. You know, this is like one of the questions I was asking at the beginning, right? Uh, I think, I think, I think I've gotten to a point where I realized that me being focused on like the actual making as opposed to like the, uh, do all in on the noise that circulates the making uh, like so actually being being in the making and actually actually spending much time behind the canvas is, is is a very like therapeutic thing that sort of like solves the problems and like calms me down you know with you know in regards to like the other uh insecurities that I have you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think that um you know as as um well obviously you know uh it, it, one of the one of the I think the the most important things to focus on for artists is that trajectory and at what phase during your career do you need more help than others and what does that help look like um you know is it is it gallery representation is it you know is it something else at what point do you need that and i think it you know it changes along that that line but one thing is for certain that it increases as you project, as you progress, it increases the needs, the time, the support, um, all of those things increase. And I think that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about it with our resident, um, our artist in resident Genevieve Ganyard in, in negotiating space and working with representation and knowing that at some point within your studio, and you've talked about it too, you will need assistance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to help you to manage. or resources, all those things do require that in that it is a heavy load on an artist by that person's self and that it requires to expand that support system. Um, and I think that obviously you're, you're a great um, example of that too. the other the other day do you do you see yourself um kind of going back and forth more often between ghana and the u.s is that part of this and i wonder did that really help your practice when you came back was there something that you know did it fill something did you find that that was kind of an exercise that needed to happen um i'm just curious for your practice I did, I did. And it, it goes back to the support system that you're talking about. Uh, and with the last, with the, with the recent show that I had, the museum show, which is my first museum solo show in Detroit. Uh, did I say Detroit? Detroit, right? right. <laughs> uh, so, it works, it works. It works. Uh, that, that was an interesting turn of, turn of events because I, for all of a sudden, I wanted to, geographical places, my stay here in Detroit, my residency in New York, which sponsored the, the show, and okay. my visit to Ghana. Uh, and then in, in going there, I realized that there was so much to ex excavate. You know, there was so much, because like with the first 10 years of living here, all the ideas and stories that I was, I was telling about my time back in Ghana were only from memory. Mm. But then I went home and it just like, it, it became more refined being there, like in having my feet on the ground and on, on the soil, like interacting with the people that I was only doing over the phone for the la last 10 years. Like I was actually face to face with them. The, the conversations were totally different from like what I expected. And I think there, there's much more to excavate there. So I want to keep that relationship still happening where I might plan to go there every year, be there for a while and make some work, you know, interact with the people and, and, uh, it even like evolved one of one of my my one of my former styles that I'm, I'm I'm working with now. There were two paintings in the show that I uh, I had some 
attachment next to it that made it look like uh I don't know if I could show up probably on let's say one sure. second. I'm pulling up my website right now and hopefully I can share my screen. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, you should be able to. Okay. Share screen, share screen, share screen. Yeah, the the the, the not being tech savvy then. It's on your website? Right. Can I, can, I can pull it up. Hold on. And hopefully you can zoom in too, because I'm realizing my website can't zoom. Um, hold on. We'll see how tech savvy I am. All right, and let's go to the next. Should I? Uh, well, go back. Let's go see. back. Yeah. Yeah. You see it, those those first two. Okay, and this one. No. And then go go back to the other one. Right. Oh, so, okay. So those elements on the side are these like little sculptural wooden dolls that yeah, okay. So these like village craftsmen work on, you know, which is like five, a five minute like walk away from where I was staying in the village. Okay. Uh, and that was a very great uh, uh, epiphany and you know an, an, an idea that I had to like add to the structure of the work to make it look like that visual journal, you know, like that that notebook format. Uh, and 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 this this is what I mean about like the evolution where I get to experience like a whole different side of of uh, the practice when I'm in a different region and in a different space and mindset too. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from from the the work that you've done. It sounds like you you've definitely grown. You've you have a lot more that you want to do. What do you feel has been? Um, gosh, I don't even know where to start. What What do you feel has been most gratifying? Not necessarily not not to equate that with a certain amount of success, but what has been most gratifying um, in your practice in your journey since since you have set out to do this and where you are now. Um, mm, I would say, I would say one patience, but then I think, I think I've already talked about it, but then another thing I, I do want to highlight is like you say, like the, the support system, because there was, there was a time where I felt alone in this game. Uh, mm -hmm. and like little, little did I know that I had people like Bev, like Jessica Silverman, like you, or like, you know, uh, people who are always available and ready to like help an uh, you know an artist to move in a direction that is supposed to you know uh, move in and uh, I did I think I did realize that that, that support system w was a little bit talked about in school but immediately after school I felt alone all of a sudden like you know having to like deal with the business side of the art world was very a bit of sort of experience uh, and again that's what i said like it was a very sharp steep learning curve uh, but then knowing that the, there are always people around resources around you know uh, connections around to always help boost someone's career or like help them sustain an our practice is one of the most like helpful things and gratifying things that i've had a privilege oh see that's a privilege to me <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of having. it is okay to use that word yeah, 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 yeah. in that context yeah, yeah. 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 No, I, I completely understand that. And it's really, it's amazing to hear you say that because, you know, I think that's, um, that's what, especially us in this academic context are most concerned about is your ability to sustain what you have built after you leave mm -hmm. like this, but who is there and you clearly warrant um, you and your work warrant um, the sort of support and attention it has received. That was never um, a surprise to me. Um, I wonder for those that, and ironically, you were so concerned your first year and then second year, it was completely different. But there are those who will still leave their, um, their institutions with an overwhelming sense of fear and anxiety about what lies ahead. Um, and I think that for, and I, I wonder what you think when, when we think about how we, we serve them. There are those who will be sought out and those for whom it will take a little bit longer and may have to do more of the seeking out to get that support. 
what would you tell them if they were like, wow, because I'm sure I, I, I'm going to guess that I wouldn't be the first person to pose the scenario. Conrad, man, you have made it. This is it. Yeah. You, right. And then yeah. you say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm st still, uh, still trying to get there. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, that, 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 that's a good, that's a good question because you know this, this this is deep and and I could go on and on about it but it's it's more like it's 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 again it's multiple fold right uh cuz i'm i'm thinking about it's also different too right and then uh you know, as someone who's coming up who also wants to be, you know, wants to have that exposure, or like you were saying, like, what would I tell to someone who 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 is yearning for that? It's 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 it's, it's more like what where the end game, where do you want your, your work to be and what are you trying to do with your work? Uh because like if we were not in this capitalist system and we didn't have like this this sort of art market where things were structured the way they are now in terms of like the market value of a piece, the hype and the rise of an artist, you know, because like that's where most of the comparison and insecurities come from, mm -hmm. right? Because as an artist coming out of school, if you didn't, if you didn't have these, these like bars and levels of like all the noise making surrounding like people, certain select artists who were being hyped, you know, we wouldn't have that, that comparison to even like measure our success and like where we are, right? So like all of a sudden, like everyone is like, trying to achieve or like be the next, the next Kahina Wiley, the next Marshall, but then, or then back in the day, who were they looking up to, and like what what was their measurement of success, right? Uh, I think there there's there suddenly I don't know. This is my personal experience. There, there, there's a much greater hype at the dawn of you know with the dawn of social media than I think there was before. So I think maybe back for them in the day, it was more like like a survival thing, right? Like just always being in the studio working, and then I think now which I do share in experiences of people who are coming out of grad school and like an undergrad and who haven't, you know, I'm, I was blessed to have a full-time practice, but I know some of my friends and peers didn't have that immediately. And uh, again, it, it, it's more like, it, it's, it's patience, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think I have the answers to it. I don't think I have, I have, I don't think there's a formula to it, you know, uh, I mean, you were right. Like, the, the, there are times where the art, the art world will selectively pick and choose, like, you know, certain people. But I'm hoping that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, is the quality and the content of the work that moves, you know, move move the work forward. You know, more so than anything else. More so, more so than like the sexuality or the or the gender or the race of a person. You know, uh, and I I would just say, say this to end on that note. Uh, I do remember getting the Cranbrook Museum purchase award uh and it was a beautiful experience and i was very proud of myself because of like i'm a, you know with, with all the pain and suffering that i had that gone through to be at a point but then i heard this comment from, from some of my friends talking about i only got that award because i was black i was like jesus christ huh uh so i mean these are coming from like white friends too right uh and then there was a point where like a guy who was a year ahead of me, who, who was also from Ghana and he's like a black, uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, he was also, cause he also like had like multiple awards that he, he, he you know, he got getting out of school. He had, a, he had a falling out among his own black friends, right? So like even internally, there's, the, there, there's, the, there's a, this, this comparison and this like, uh, contention that still happens, you know, when like one person gets like highlighted above, above the rest. And I've been through it, you know, uh, and then I, I came out on the other end and I, I, it's at the end of the day, you only have one thing to focus on and like that's the work, you know. That's right. So. That's right. Um, and, you know, I, it, it is it is that it is that complicated and it is that simple at the same time. <laughs> and um, I, I feel like you have summed it up perfectly. This always goes by so much quicker than we hope or anticipate. 
Um, you know, usually the last two questions I ask are, what do you feel you have more to learn in your practice and what have you learned to date? You answered all of that and more. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think to the benefit of those of us who work within the art world, understand it, pursue careers in it. And I um, feel so, so, so pleased and uh, honored to be able to have these sort of discussions with you because you are so generous and you are so, um, you are so understanding of what this means and that's important to those of us within this that do the exact same thing you do but in a different way and i thank you for that and i thank you for spending this time with us um i am looking forward to this uh virtual exhibition that's going to um i guess be the precursor to the actual show that will happen right. at uta that jessica silverman is curating and there will be a talk Shall we plug that on the 29th? I think you were talking with uh, Arthur Lewis on that. And I think- yeah, Just William, yeah. And, um, and you and I will always, always be talking and you know, beyond words. I, I just am so, I'm so proud of you. You know, I say that every time we talk, um, yeah. but I'm more proud of what you do to pay it forward. Mm. That's what mm. you do. And so I thank you. I wish you the best of luck for this upcoming virtual. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I will definitely be there for that talk. And you and I will be talking again soon. So thank you so much, Brad. And, and thank you so much for having me on too. I really do appreciate it. Of yeah. course, of course. And be well, be safe. And um, this will be available for those that didn't get a chance to spend some time with us. And we'll look forward to spending time with you again in the future. My best. Likewise. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take, Take care. care. Thank you.